Good morning. Welcome to worship. It is great to see you all, to be back together today. Uh, and there are many updates to share with you all, which we will do throughout this time of worship this morning. But it really is good to be together and to see you all. And I know that there are many whose lives have changed dramatically since we last gathered together. There is a lot of work left to do. There has been progress, but there is still a lot of unknown and difficult decisions to be made. And this is a good place to be, to have just a time, a short while to pray, to sing praises and to give God thanks and put our faith and trust in him through it all even when we might not know what the next steps will bring. But let me begin with a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, would you fall fresh on us who have gathered here this morning and those who join online wherever they may be. It is a privilege to gather in your name to hear scripture, to think about the wide embrace that you offer for each of us. I give you thanks for the privilege to gather and Lord, would this be a time that is pleasing to you? And would we all leave this place energized and filled up with the power of your spirit for the week ahead? And we all said together, Amen. Amen. Would you join me in our call to worship? We gather as God's beloved children. We come together as a people whom Jesus calls into community. We have come to give thanks, to pray and sing, to be with each other. Let us worship God. Amen. Good morning. good morning. It really is good to see you here this morning. Our first hymn is Rise Up, Ye Men of God, or O Men of God. And it was written by Robert Merrill. He was from Orange, New Jersey. Any New Jersey people out there? No? Yes. Yes. Things, things must be great up there. Everybody's staying home. But we are glad that you were here, and we're glad that he wrote this hymn, because it encourages us to know the kind of road that we are on. He wrote it as a hymn of brotherhood for the Presbyterian Church back in the early 20th century. We today have changed the words a little bit. Rise up, ye saints of God, because we have to have the women included, so we made it saints. What can I say? <laughs> so we are going to sing, and between three and four, there will be a um, little interlude there. Just be aware of that. Let's stand and sing. Rise up, ye saints of God.
what a great way to prepare to affirm our faith. Would you join me with the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I want to take just a couple of moments and share with the congregation some of the realities of what happened to the church campus with uh, the most recent storm. As you probably have noticed a few uh, things when you arrived on campus this morning, uh, the reality is that we have 11 buildings on this campus and uh, all of them have received uh, pretty significant roof damage. Uh, so for our sanctuary and for our fellowship hall and our office complex, which has the terracotta shingles. Uh, several of those are individually broken or on the uh, ridges at the tops or on the slants, and the hope is that those can be individually patched. And uh, we give God thanks that there is only one small leak in the parlor, and that has already been uh, tended to. But every other building on campus has asphalt shingles, uh, and those roofs uh, took a lot worse damage. And so those have been assessed and sealed properly with a damage mitigation group that we have been working with, and we did detect one uh, leak in the preschool, and then there was a pretty significant leak where those air conditioners are on the roof right next to the parking lot uh, in the office. All of the contents of those few rooms did need to be uh, thrown out, or we're going to try our best to save a lot of uh, the tools and the things that we had stored in those rooms, but that roof for sure will have to be replaced. Uh, many of you might not know this, but we also have 24 air conditioners on this campus. And by some miracle, they are all working right now. <laughs> don't tell me you don't believe in miracles, okay? <laughs> Uh, but we will, of course, with the mitigation team and our insurance adjuster, perform assessments to make sure that they are all functioning and can continue to do so uh, for a long time to come. Uh, we did have several trees down on campus, a uh, few of which went through the power lines and had to be uh, totally removed. Some are still in progress, but we did get power back on Monday evening, so that meant the school could open on Tuesday and our students and staff return to campus on Tuesday. Uh, we did have some issues with the water for just a short time. Those have all been restored, uh, and it was a blessing that the majority of the debris has been removed before worship uh, this Sunday. But I did want to offer a special thanks to everybody who did come and uh, offer their time to help get our campus cleaned up. And I know many of you were offering your prayers. And by God's grace, nobody got hurt, and everybody is still a member of the church that came to help. So that is a good thing. So your prayers worked. Uh, the reality is... Uh, there will be uh, months of work to do to get our campus back to the place that we knew it just a week ago. Uh, but we have had great support from the Florida Annual Conference and our shared uh, insurance company from our damage mitigation company called Belfour. And I was just on the phone yesterday evening with our insurance adjuster who will be on campus this Wednesday. So my commitment to our congregation is just to continue to share updates as I receive them. And 
uh, we will continue to move forward day by day and step by step just as we all are in our own individual lives as well. And if you do have any specific questions or ideas or feel this is an area that you know a good bit about, I would welcome those conversations. Uh, but we have a very gifted and smart leadership team and staff and people who have been helping out wherever they can. And I know that will not change as we move into the future. Uh, but a reality is, in a time like this, I think we're all searching for hope. We're all searching for a little healing. So I, again, uh, wanted to make sure you had the date of November 3rd on your calendar. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to have a concert for hope and healing uh, right here in our sanctuary. A pretty legendary composer named Lloyd Larson will be here that weekend for uh, a festival with our choir and several of the other choirs that Shelby and her team have invited uh, from the community and they'll participate in worship that morning. Uh, And then that concert will be at two o'clock in the afternoon. And I think it'll be one of those things you'll always remember uh, that we came together for a time of worship and praise and simply being together and we're able to host many other churches and their choirs as well. So that's that concert on November the 3rd at 2 p.m. So again, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Uh, But that is the status of our campus for now. And I'll invite Pastor John to come and lead us in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we come before you this morning, it is good to be able to gather together. It is a special Sunday to gather because we could not last week. And over the past several weeks, our lives have been turned inside out and upside down. Some of us have suffered major damages to places we call home. Others of us have suffered from the stress and the anxiety and even the fear of the unknown as a new future is coming our way. We ask you to pour your spirit out upon us and be a source of comfort, especially for those whose lives have been so dramatically changed. We ask you to be a source of healing for those whose lives and dreams and hopes have been broken. We ask you to be a source of courage for those who are facing the unknown and fear, perhaps dread, and certainly anxiety seem to reign be a source of courage and encouragement. Lord, the words that come to mind so quickly are, Lord, help us. Help us in whatever manner we need to be helped and help us in whatever manner you know is best for us. And amid all the damage and destruction and the heartache, there are also reminders, very tangible reminders, of your loving presence. Neighbors working with neighbors to help clear away debris. Friends gathering to to help with houses that have been totally torn apart. Acts of incredible bravery by our first responders, and the list could go on. Help us to remember those as well, to draw our strength not from our own resources but yours. And let us go into this future first seeking your guidance, then seeking your strength, And lastly, putting all our hope and trust in you. 
And as your people, we join together to pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we are still in an attitude of prayer, I wanted to also make mention that on November 3rd, the first Sunday in November, is also All Saints Sunday. Uh, that is the day each year where we remember uh, all of those who have passed away within the life of our church or that were a part of our families from November of last year until November of this year. Uh, our, what we do to honor those is we uh, show a photograph of them if we uh, receive one the year that they were born the year that they pass away. Uh, we read their full name, uh, we ring a bell, and we light a candle, and then we invite folks in the congregation to stand if they uh, knew or had a relationship with that individual. And it is one of the holiest traditions that we have as a church. And so if you uh, have lost someone this year that you would like to honor and remember, uh, please send us their photograph if you have it, or if it's just a printed out one and you need help scanning it, just come by the church office and we can do that, no problem, uh, but send us their full name, the year that they were born, and the year that they passed away, and we'll make sure that we recognize them on All Saints Sunday on November 3rd. I did want to uh, remind the congregation as well that tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock p.m. right here in the sanctuary is our annual church conference. If you're not familiar with that is, uh, that is our annual business meeting of the church where we uh, vote and talk about a variety of different items for the upcoming year. We hear a report from the chair of our leadership team. I share a few reflections from the past year and as we move into the future, as well as our district superintendent, Reverend Dr. Debbie. Allen will share some comments on behalf of our district and annual conference. She will also be serving as the presiding elder. Uh, all are welcome to attend the church conference, but only members of our church in good standing are welcome to vote on the voting items. So we remember who our retired clergy are in our congregation, who are our lay servants and ministers. We vote on leadership and we have a conversation about budget and some of our financial realities moving into the next year as well. So again, tomorrow at 6 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. Uh, you probably also figured out by driving by this morning, uh, we had to make the difficult decision that we could not uh, have the pumpkin patch this year. Just with all that's going on and the delays with certain things, uh, the company and Olivia with her leadership at the youth ministry uh, just thought we won't be able to do that this year, but we are already having conversations to make sure we are on the schedule for next year and we'll be able to bring uh, the pumpkin patch back to our church. Uh, but we are turning then all of our resources and attention to the fall festival on Friday evening. That's this Friday from 5 to 7 in the pavilion. We've got lots of folks sign up to do a trunk. We are going to have hot dogs and water and chips to give away uh, to the community. But Miss Darcy did share she is still in need of a few extra bags of candy. So if you are out uh, shopping this week and see any and you are able to, we'd be grateful uh, if you drop those by the church office so that way we can uh, have some fun on Friday evening and let our church be a blessing uh, to our community. Community with everything that has gone on. Uh, now we are preparing for our weekly offering, a chance for us to give back to the church that has been a blessing to us and God's faithfulness. And I'll share with you a reality that I know today, and there'll be more to come over the coming weeks. I'm sure many of you are thinking, uh, if we're moving forward with an insurance claim, what does a deductible look like for a campus that has as many buildings as we do? Uh, the reality is for, every, for our claim, it is 5% of the total insured value of every 
every building of the campus that has had impact, which I shared earlier is all of them. Uh, so we're going to meet with the adjuster and our teams this week to fi figure out some financial realities and make those decisions of which you will all continue uh, to be informed. But my request today with not having all the information is for you all to begin praying about how God might be working in your life to help us uh, gather these resources. And this will be a congregation-wide effort over the next several months so we can continue our ministry and ensure our campus is as safe as it can be and get it back to the way that we know it. Uh, but for this morning, I remind you there are two ways you can make a gift to the church. In just a few moments, our ushers will uh, pass the offering plates up and down the pews, uh, or you can scan the QR code in the corner of the screen with the camera on your phone. And that'll take you to our church website, which is trinitybradenton.com, where you can make a gift there. And the last reminder I have for you is we still have the uh, Hurricane Relief Fund that we started at the church, and several of you have made very generous donations to help the folks who have been impacted most severely. And uh, next week, I'll have a more full report of how those resources have been shared with folks in our community. Uh, so again, thank you for your weekly faithfulness, and I thank you for beginning to pray about our next steps as a congregation as well. So now as we listen to our anthem, I'll invite our ushers to serve the congregation now.
But Lord, we offer these gifts to you. Would you use them to help build and repair your kingdom here on earth? And would they be a blessing to so many in the days, weeks, and months ahead? We thank you for the hands that gave them. And now we offer them to you as we say together. Amen. Please be seated. We are called to be a people of wide embrace. Our love of the other is rooted in God's love for us. As Wesleyans, we seek to love others as we have been loved in Christ. We acknowledge that not all people think alike, but we believe that all can love alike. This morning, we're going to continue in our sermon series that we've been in for the last several weeks called Wesleyan Rooted, and we're doing this alongside hundreds of other congregations across Florida. And we've been remembering our founders, John and Charles Wesley, who were brothers in their small group of friends who started the Methodist movement several hundred years ago. And for the last three weeks, we've started, we've talked about uh, growing deeply in our relationship with God and then with one another as well. We then spent a week talking about how do we read and faithfully interpret and apply scripture to our lives. And then last week, we read those words from Matthew 25, one of the last things that Jesus says, where he says, we will be judged by how we treated the least of these, how we showed mercy and how we showed kindness and compassion and love to them. And this morning, we're moving into our fourth week where we're going to talk about uh, embracing widely. And to remember or think more about how do we do that as Methodists, we're going to read a story that I would imagine for many of us is very familiar, one you've probably heard before. But there is one focal part in the story about an embrace between a father and a son. And I want to share this whole story with you. It's from the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter from uh, verses 11 to 32. So I've asked Pastor John to come and help me read this parable of Jesus. And again, if you've heard it before, maybe you listen for something maybe you had forgotten. Or if you're not familiar with this story, uh, I think you'll like it. So hear now the word of the Lord. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the wealth that will belong to me. So he divided his assets between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant region. And there he squandered his wealth in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the region, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that region who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. And when he had come to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was yet still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe and the best one and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And he get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine, who is dead, is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. 
Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours come, came back, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Oftentimes when we hear this story, whether that's for the first time or for maybe the hundredth time, we usually identify ourselves with one of the characters in the story. Most of us, I imagine, would think of ourselves as maybe the smart and thoughtful and compassionate parent, or maybe you connected with the child who did everything right. But would it surprise you if I were to say to you this morning that a hard truth is this, we are all the younger son. We are all the child who has squandered our inheritance. But it's not all doom and gloom because thanks be to God, we all get another chance. You see, when the youngest son misspent his inheritance, he, he lost his father's trust. He burned that bridge. And then the way that he used that inheritance communicated uh, a little or even more uh, non-approval for his father's work in life. It was a violation of trust and one that would have been very hard to reestablish. And that started the second he asked for his inheritance before his father had died, and then added insult to injury with his behavior. And for us, we might not live a life that lines up exactly like this story, but we all do live a life where Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, offers us a new life, a life full of grace and of mercy, of kindness and of compassion, and we time and time and time again throw that all away for temporary feelings of satisfaction. We fall into the temptation to pursue this world rather than deepening our relationship with Christ, and we oftentimes have to deal with the results of the decisions that we make. But here's the good news, the very good news, that the God we serve, the God that we are gathered here to worship today is just like the Father in this parable, in this story. Many have said uh, this story is typically called the parable of the prodigal son, but others, and it's become more and more popular, begin calling this story the parable of the loving father. And the parable is among one of the best stories ever told, not only because of the characters that are there, but it also uh, observes some real human dynamics that I think we all feel throughout our lives. Jesus in this story shows us what it means and what it feels like to be embraced and to be loved, especially when we might not feel like we deserve it from anyone else. And there's one, particularly, one particular line in the story where the young son really realizes how bad his situation is and how bad the decisions he has made are. It's in verse 19. He says, I'm going to go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. In that moment, you could tell the son thinks there's going to be no forgiveness. There will be no second chance. But really, what other choice did he have? The younger son evaluated his situation and knew that he needed to start over again. And he absolutely needed help to do it. And the story goes on, not many verses later, we find out that the father pays very little attention to his own self-assessment. Instead of casting judgment and yelling at his child and berating him, what does he do? He calls for a fresh robe to be put on him. 
to remove the dirty and disgusting robe that he would have had on from caring for the pigs, which in that culture would have been the lowest of the low jobs. And then he calls for sandals to be put on his feet and then a ring to be put on his finger. That probably would have been a signet ring or a family ring. So as he, his father put that ring back on his finger, he's saying, you are a part of this family. You are my son, despite the decisions you have made. And in that story, I think we would all agree, there was a lot of courage of the father to forgive his son or to offer him another chance. There was deep love that the father offered for his son. And in both of those virtues that are linked together quite closely, there had to be vulnerability. The father had to take a risk on his son that his son would change and accept the new reality that they were living in. And I think that is really at the pinnacle in this story, uh, the focal point, as I said, when the father runs out to greet his son and embraces him. There are scholars who say fathers in that day would have never run. That would have not been the custom. So the fact that Jesus puts that in the story shows us how emotionally moved the father was to see his son that he thought he had lost forever. And in this story, Jesus shows us that our God is a God of wide embrace. And that's a phrase you're going to hear me say several times this morning. Our God is a God of wide embrace. I imagine you've already done it, but maybe think for a second in your mind what that scene would have looked like with the father running out to meet his son. Maybe you've experienced one of those moments in your life where a child or a grandchild, you go running up to them and pick them up with a hug. You're so excited to see them. You have a visual in your mind, and then maybe you could think about, is there somebody that you shared a hug with at church this morning when you saw them? You were so excited to see them and to check in, or you think about a hug that's with somebody that you've shared with this week, and those hugs just can mean the world. That embrace is so powerful, and yet it's also so simple at the same time. There's a book called Exclusion and Embrace by Miroslav Volf, and he breaks down the anatomy of a hug. And I found this fascinating. I don't know if you've ever stopped to think for a moment about the anatomy of a hug, but there are four different things we go through when we offer an embrace to someone else. So the first part is we have to open our arms, right? And this communicates to the person that we open our arms towards that I'm discontent being by myself right now and that I want to be connected to you. I want you to be a part of who I am and I'll share a piece of who I am with you as well. And then we get to the second part, the big part, the waiting. Is the other person going to open their arms and walk towards you or have you just encountered a very awkward situation? But you can't impose yourself on someone, right? You need to respect their boundaries. Otherwise, it kind of ruins the whole purpose of the embrace and that moment of vulnerable connection. It requires some mutuality. And then we get to the great part, the closing of the arms and that amazing paradox. And in that embrace, I am holding you. I'm lifting you up and you are doing the same for me. And it's not costing me or costing you anything. But there is so much power in that moment. And yet we have to be gentle and kind towards one another as well. Sometimes a bear hug is appropriate. Maybe just not on the first hug with somebody that you don't know. And then at the end, it all culminates together when we open our arms and we step back and we go back to being me and you go back to being you. And yet a piece of you stays with me and a piece of me stays with you. We share in that connection with one another and it empowers us. It encourages us, and it renews us to move forward to whatever's next. Isn't it a special feeling to receive that hug, to receive that connection and that kindness with someone else? And in this parable that Jesus talks about, he is saying to all of us throughout history, he says, this is how God seeks to be with you. That our God is a God of wide embrace that opens his arms to embrace and to hold us, every piece of us. The parts that only we know about are the parts that we show the world. God embraces all of who we are. 
And then we are encouraged, we are challenged to also live this out in our daily lives with how we treat those that we know and even those that we might not know. You see, and this is absolutely our part of our roots as Methodists. John and Charles, the brothers that were founders of our movement, they were faithful priests in the Church of England. They loved their church and they loved the spirituality that the church helped provide to them. And they would daily read from what's called the Book of Common Prayer. And I'm sure many of you have heard of that book. It's a book of just like what it sounds, a lot of daily prayers that you can offer. And there was one particular prayer that they would say, uh, I would imagine multiple days a week. And I wanted to share that prayer with you because it connects to our scripture so well today. The prayer says this, Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For the honor of your name, amen. Have you ever thought about Jesus' posture on the cross? Arms wide open for all who would come and receive. This prayer celebrates a God of wide embrace that we most vividly know through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. A God that takes all into his loving embrace. A God who forgives all who come before him and repent and ask for their forgiveness. But this scripture is not Jesus saying, well, it's all God's responsibility and the rest of us, we are off the hook. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus and his early followers throughout the New Testament, they remind us that we are to imitate Christ in our words, our thoughts, and our actions. We're to be ambassadors of reconciliation or brokenness in the world. We have a ministry of reaching out, of welcoming and embracing and including. And this is one of the main ways that the world comes to know the love of God for them. And it's through you. It's through me. It's for us modeling that for the world that is around us. And that wide reach or that inviting all to be a part of the movement is what fueled the Methodists through the first many, many years. But this type of work is serious. And it's not as easy as we might think it is. You see, to make room for others often entails some pretty serious interior work, the work that nobody else can see but God. It involves making space in each of our hearts for people who might be a little different than us. And it means asking God to change our attitudes and transform what might be our hostility into hospitality. Our hostility into hospitality. But it also involves some exterior actions. When you open your arms to others, you're offering compassion to those in need. And it means asking God to teach us how to create space for those who are on the outside, who might not know what happens on the inside here in this circle of love that we call the church. This wide embrace, this story of God's love for all is one that's characterized our tradition for centuries because it is what God has done for us. So now that we know that this idea is a part of our roots as Methodists, it's rooted in scripture through the story of the prodigal son, I wanna share with you a practical way that you can cultivate a spirit of embracing widely in your own life. And it's pretty good timing for everything we've been through the last few weeks. I would imagine you have probably met a few of your neighbors over the last couple of weeks, just being in the yard or checking on one another. And maybe you thought to yourself, I wonder why that person is that way. You can be honest. You did think that at least about one of those neighbors, okay? But that ideally would lead to hopefully meeting a few of your neighbors. And I bet one person, maybe two, maybe more, caught your attention and you thought, I want to get to know that person a little better. I wonder what their story is or how might my life be enriched by knowing them. 
And I would encourage you, it's a simple but vulnerable invitation to say, hey, uh, I'd really like to get to know the people near me a little bit better. Could you and I share a cup of coffee and we share in a time of conversation together? I just want to get to know you a little bit better. And then hopefully the person says yes. It's not a foolproof method. There might be a few people who say, no, I'm not doing that. But that's when you go to the next neighbor and hopefully that person will really want to be in connection. And when you finally do get together for that time of coffee and conversation, the first step is to ask them a question about them. And I promise you, they will start talking. They will talk and they will talk. (laughs) And what we have to do is to be quiet. We have to listen because everyone's got a story to tell. And everybody so desperately wants to tell their story, but so few people are willing to listen. And I'm talking about listening actively, not listening to respond, not listening to fix or to offer some empty platitude to make ourselves feel better, truly listening, letting a person feel heard and cared for. And then at some point, this is normally what happens, that person's going to realize how long they've been talking, and then they'll be embarrassed and they'll go, and tell me about you. (laughs) Then it's your turn. And you can share whatever's on your heart and get to know that person. You never know how that one conversation could change your life or change that person's life. And I would imagine at some point along the way, you would talk about Jesus. And you would talk about your faith and the love that you have found in him. And maybe you want to share it with them too. I think it's kind of just the art of how to make friends, right? And I think it's a skill that we as Christ followers could be leading the way in, in our neighborhoods and in our communities. Because like I said, it is difficult. It is vulnerable to say this or to offer this invitation to someone because none of us wants to be told no. Nobody wants to be, "Ah, I made that person feel this way or that way. But our call is to model what Christ offered to us, a kind and a compassionate and a caring relationship. Because friends, if people know that you are a Christian or you go to church, they are watching you and they're going to see how you act and respond. And I don't know, there's this big thing coming up in a few weeks as well. And people are going to see how you are posting on social media and how you're responding to people with your thumbs. Or are we willing to have the real and hard conversations face to face and to do it with kindness, even through some disagreements we might have? That is the biblical way. That is the way of Christ. That's the way I believe God offers hope to us all, because you and me and all of us, we're Christ's ambassadors in the world. And it happens one conversation at a time. We've all been through a lot the last couple weeks. I think there's plenty more of that to come as people continue to rebuild. But I remind us all, we all have gifts. We can offer a handshake. We could offer a glass of cold water. We could bring someone a meal. We can simply look someone in the eye and maybe share a tear with them and say, I am sorry for what you have been through. How can I stand beside you or support you as we move forward? And truthfully, as Methodists, that's what we've been doing for hundreds of years. And I think that's a really great legacy for us to hold on to and march forward into the future. You've heard me say it once, if not 50 times. Wouldn't it be great if somebody said, oh, you go to the Methodist church on Manatee Avenue. Those are the nicest and most loving people in Bradenton. You're supposed to say, yeah, that would be awesome, Pastor Robert. Yeah. I'll leave you with this. Luke 15, 20 said this, the father ran and put his arms around him. My friends, this is the way of Jesus. May it be our way as well. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for the story of the prodigal son or for the loving father. Thank you for this reminder that you are just like the father in the story, that you open your arms for us and you say, I love you, I care about you, I forgive you, and you are mine, not just for today, but for eternity. Would we put our whole hope and our whole trust in you? And would we do the work both inside and outside to be your ambassadors in the world, to share hope and healing with our own city, our own community, and so many who need love, who need healing, and who need hope? Would we not put our light under a bushel, 
but would we show it on a city on a hill and be a people of wide embrace. We all said together, amen. I hope you're noticing this week and this month that uh, our wonderful organist, Bruce, is playing music that was written by Samuel Wesley, who was the son of Charles Wesley and the nephew of John Wesley. I hope that you're enjoying those preludes and postludes. I think they're wonderful. Our last hymn today is the servant song. Let's stand and sing. Just two quick reminders of our church conference tomorrow at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary and the fall festival on Friday evening from 5 to 7 in the pavilion. Now, as you go forth, may the God who knows you and who cares about you and loves you more than you could ever imagine give you the strength and the courage to take each new day head on, trusting that he will guide you each step of the way. Amen and amen. amen.